you stand, please? We're reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 25. Just watch and read silently with me as I read it for you. And there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And here on earth the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and the strange tides. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when all these things begin to happen, stand up and look. Your salvation is near. And then he gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unawares like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I didn't know exactly what to do with this message until yesterday morning. I had some idea through the week. Usually I get my message done many days in advance so that I can think about it, uh, but that wasn't the case this week. Of course, it's a holiday week. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving. We certainly did. But I want to talk today about learning to wait. This is a message that's kind of like talking about the marking of time. In 1582, Pope Gregory revised uh, the calendar that the Western world had used since Emperor Just, uh, Justin or Julius Caesar had uh, ordered his calendar in, in 46 BC. So that had been the calendar in the Western world until 1582. And so for, in the West, for the last 500 years, we have been using the calendar that we're now familiar with, with its 12 months and, and so forth. And, and uh, in the last uh, 100 years or so, most of the world has adopted the Western calendar. We, we know that there's other ways of marking time. We hear about the Chinese New Year, and we're like, wow, they have a different New Year than we do. Wow, that's interesting. And then we know about the Jewish calendar. You may not know, but uh, in the Jewish calendar, it's now uh, 5776. Uh, that's the years that Moses received the law of God on Mount Sinai, so... Uh, and, and the Jewish people even order uh, their days differently than, uh, than we do in secular time. Because in a Jewish idea, the day begins with sunset. So they mark a day, Sabbath, for example, begins a sunset of our Friday, and then at sunset and our Saturday, Sabbath is concluded. Uh, that's, by the way, how we begin to uh, celebrate the Lord's Day on Sunday, was that the, you would celebrate the Passover, and then, uh, then you would go into the, later in the evening, then it's, it's the beginning of the new day, which is Sunday, the Lord's Day. So in time, we decided not to worship in the middle of the night, and so we started worshiping early in the morning. Now we worship whenever. It's an interesting thing. So we think of our calendar that we use every day as being kind of secular, and we, th we, we cannot hardly imagine any other way of marking time. It just seems like that's the day it is. We're about to celebrate a new year in a few weeks, and that seems really momentous. We're turning the page of a calendar. It's a new year. But really, we made it all up. It's just a myth agreed upon. And in a way, our, what we call our secular calendar is really also a religious calendar because it divides the, all of history into the two eras, the Old and the New Testament. So we have B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domine, the year of the Lord. And so uh, that, that's kind of an adaptation also of a Christian calendar. And, and a Christian calendar is, uh, in turn, an adaptation of the Jewish calendar. 
But the Christian calendar, purely speaking, I mean, when we really uh, observe the Christian year, loosely based upon the Jewish calendar, and, be, and it begins today. This is the new year of Christian calendar, beginning today. The first Sunday of Advent. And it's a different way of marking time. So each year we walk through the, lives, the life of Christ from Advent, uh, which is the coming of Christ, the waiting of Christ, and then in Christmas, and then Epiphany, which is uh, the wise men coming, uh, representing the ingathering of all the Gentiles into the church. And then we go in through Lent, which is, of course, the, uh, the death of, of Christ ending in Easter. And then after Easter, we go to Pentecost, which is the birth of the church. And then for the next six months, then we go in what's called ordinary time, where we learn to, uh, to um, uh, embody all the things that we have learned uh, in these very special events uh, to our day-to-day -day life. If you want to go deeper in this, even uh, Christian, there's, in the Christian calendar, the, the day is ordered differently. So the so-called hours of prayer, uh, which is prime and sect and noct and vespers and, and combine and so forth. And that's all based on the old uh, Roman calendar. But the first season of the Christian year is about waiting. And I wonder, what could I talk to you about about waiting? We're not a people that like to wait for anything. But there's a few things that we cannot help but wait on. And I thought of something that I have just experienced that I'm going to tell you about. Early in summer last year, my daughter Talitha in Phoenix called me and said, is mom there? Yes. Get on the speakerphone. I've got something to tell you. Okay, we got on the speakerphone. What's going on? What's, what's happening? She said, I'm pregnant. We're going to have a baby. We're going to have a baby. Now, her daughter uh, is 11 years old, uh, and, uh, and yet she was going to have a baby. So this was a surprise to us, a new grandchild. We didn't know anything about this baby. Talitha didn't look any different. Things weren't, didn't seem to be any different, but we knew a baby was coming. And then as the weeks passed and months passed, then one day I had a call and it said, Dad, um, I heard the baby's heartbeat for the first time today. The baby has a heartbeat. I heard the heartbeat. And then later on, we learned the gender of the baby, which we now do and used not to know that. Meanwhile, my daughter was growing larger, and in the last few weeks, she's petite, and she grew very, very large, and I began to worry. On the day of the birth, uh, I actually uh, was in Kentucky burying my daughter's grandmother, um, and so my mother-in-law had passed away, and we buried my mother-in-law. And then we were, uh, I was trying to get to a wedding that I was to do, um, and, uh, and I had to go across all the rural counties of Kentucky and Tennessee to get to this wedding, get there on time, and was kind of stressed out, no way of talking to my daughter. Every once in a while, uh, my son-in-law would call, but the birth, the, it just kept going on and on and on through the day. I got home that night, and I was exhausted, and I went to bed. Trish was still in Kentucky. Somewhere, I don't know, in the middle of the night, um, my other daughter, Tiffany, shakes me, wakes me up, and said, Dad, the baby's born, the baby's healthy, uh, Talitha's okay, and I vaguely remember that. The next morning was service, so I came to church, and my phone rang, and uh, I looked and it was my son-in-law. My son-in-law also is a pastor. I knew that he wouldn't call me in the middle of church unless something, something was really important. I, I, I went out into the hallway, took the call, and he said, I just didn't want you to worry. Uh, Talitha and the baby are fine. The doctor says they're going to be fine. That was the first time I knew anything was wrong. And then I found out that the day had been difficult the last few uh, Hours of this pregnancy, of this birth, had been very, very difficult, and there was complications, and the baby was in danger for a while, and uh, my my daughter was not having an easy time. It's interesting, though. The next day, I talked to my parents, 
And my mother said, yeah, you know, your dad got up in the morning yesterday and said, I'm going to be in prayer a good most of the day today because Talitha's not going to have an easy delivery and the Lord's put it on my heart to pray for her. So here's the great-grandfather and the grandfather and the grandmothers and the great-grandmothers. My son-in-law is Dutch and so across the ocean there was another family. We didn't know at the time, but our families are being united slowly, gradually as we've been waiting. And then... Two weeks ago, I went for the christening of the child, give him his name. And we met in the service, and there was maybe 45 people there, and we had a full-blown service with communion and the whole schmear, and, and uh, there's several pastors involved, so we all had to have our say, but I'm the one that got to give the child the name. And I'm holding the child, and I said, this child's name, I understand, is Jacob. Daniel, Cornelius, Van Leon. And I said, that's a really long name for a little tiny boy. And my son-in-law said, yeah, we should have dropped the Daniel. <laughs> and so, you know, even the most sacred of times, uh, you always have these kinds of dark things that can come up <laughs> all of a sudden. So then that had to be translated, and then other people from Holland are laughing, and we're together, and then afterwards we're having some refreshment together and so forth. It's interesting to me. This child doesn't know that I'm in the world. It doesn't know his great-grandfather was praying for him the day he was born. He doesn't know that he has these two kinds of heritages coming into his life. He doesn't know any of this. This child doesn't know anything except eating, sleeping, and filling a diaper very regularly all through the day. And yet, all of these people surround this child, uh, connected to this child, and thus connected to one another because we have been waiting for him to come, and we are so delighted that he's here. The waiting has changed our little corner of the world. You may not have been aware of my grandson's birth, or you may have been slightly aware of it. You may have seen some things on Facebook, but uh, it didn't affect your world because you're in kind of a different time. Your attention there is on different things, but this this is a huge part of my world. This is... This is a colossal part of my world. And I thank God and I have every day. Thank you for allowing me to be alive. To see this little grandson born. My fifth grandchild. And I thank you. It is a great, great privilege that I have. The Bible talks a lot about waiting and teaches us to wait. Christopher was playing an old song on the piano. Those of you that have been around a while knew it probably and recognize it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. To those who love his appearing will he appear, the Bible says. What is about waiting? There's a kind of a pain in waiting. We're kind of missing something we've never had before when we're waiting. There's an uncertainty. There's a perplexity. We, we think something is happening. We're not sure what. Come thou long expected Jesus. Come to set thy people free. It kind of expresses it. But for me, no Carol expresses it like one of my dearest carols to me is In the Bleak Midwinter by Christina Rossetti. In the bleak midwinter, frosty winds made moan. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow. In the bleak midwinter long ago. It's an interesting setting. It stands after stands as she begins to prepare us for the birth of Christ. That the birth of Christ begins in the darkness. In the bleak midwinter. And, and is it different for us? It, it, don't, sometimes, you know, when you, if, you, if you will look... At the secular time, you will be in despair. The world is filled with violence, not only across the world, but here. 
And we just woke up to violence in Colorado the other day. We're numb to it now, unused to it. Another school shooting, another mall shooting, somebody at the theater, someplace over in another country. Violence and violence. And then there's our own hardening hearts as we are no longer pierced by it and we begin to become hardened and embittered. And the cruelty of our language begins to become a sport. And we see people making almost a game of how they can cut and slash people up on social media and on television and make some people laugh and some people despair. Civility goes out the window. You don't win anything until there's blood on the ground. Somebody has to die. Civility means weakness. There is no way to be kind to your adversary. We live such a cruel and difficult time. It's dark if you are tuned to secular time. But there's a joy in waiting. When you know a secret, something else is going on in the world that's different than all of that. When I knew that I was having a grandson, I began to be concerned about my granddaughter that's 11 years old. How will she do with this? This is a blended family. She's an only child and now her mother is having another child. What is she going to think about this? I began to think, what can I do? How? So she was visiting. I said, let's go on a walk. And we were on a walk. And I said, what do you think about the new baby? And I stopped to look in her face. And I saw the sparkle in her eyes and the smile that covered her whole face. And she said, I'll let you hold him. Sometimes. <laughs> and I watched her want to buy baby clothes and to do, you know, just she couldn't get enough. And when I saw the first picture of her holding her little brother and I saw her look in his face and I knew this child has been waiting a long time for a brother or a sister. She's been anticipating Advent's about waiting. There's many ways we can do this. I, a lot of people in some cultures and traditions have an Advent calendar. If you ever had one of these, and every day you open a little door on the Advent calendar in anticipation for Christmas and little children to open each door keeps leading to the final door when it's Christmas time and they open the gifts on the tree. Then we have the candles. And we light one each week, and then finally Christmas is here. The anticipation. In the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every, every mountain will be laid low, and the plains will be lifted up. The rough places will be made smooth. Prepare, prepare you the way of the Lord. So we prepare. And when we are waiting, we prepare for this little baby. We were buying clothes that the baby may never wear because he has many, many clothes. And different cousins and uncles and aunts and grandparents all buying clothes with special things on them that they think is cute. And the family and the friends. And that's the way we are with Advent. Can I tell you something? This Advent, why don't you go deeper into the spirit of the season. Don't stress. I say, how do you not stress for Christmas? If you're, oh, you know, and I, I appreciate the secular Christmas. I know the pagans can celebrate a nice day in the middle of the winter for them too. It's good. And who knows? It gives us an opportunity to talk to them. I just don't get offended by all of that, of all the different holidays. And I don't say, Dad, God, it, it's Christmas. That sounds like Scrooge to me. <laughs> And like, you can't enjoy Christmas, then go to hell. You know, that just doesn't sound, somehow seem like, you know, that goes with Merry Christmas. <laughs> Don't stress. Don't go into debt. Don't go into debt buying Christmas presents you can't afford. You know, a lot of the things we get, it's the, the people, they're like, oh, gee, thanks. It's, it goes round and round, makes a noise. It's... 
wonderful, I'll put it right here, you know. And like later they're like, what am I going to do with it? It just, oh. Isn't it right? So if it's about giving our heart, let's find ways of giving our heart. Don't go into debt. Don't stress all these parties, you know, for people you don't want to entertain. <laughs> What's that got to do with anything? Don't do that. Why are you, why are you I guess we better invite the Smiths. My God. They, uh, Smiths like, oh, gee whiz. Really, you got to invite the Smiths? Don't invite the Smiths. <laughs> Either that or go to them and make things right and then invite them so you can enjoy the party. <laughs> There's some sense when we wait of already having what we are waiting for. The Apostle Paul says that the Lord has given us something to keep us, to tide us over into the second coming. He's given us what Paul calls the earnest of our inheritance. It's the Holy Spirit. Praise God. It's a real estate term. Those of you in real estate know you're going to buy something and, and uh, you say, here's a, my earnest money. If I, if I don't go through the deal, you can have the money. That's what earnest money is. The Lord gives the Holy Spirit to us to say, I'm serious. I'm going to redeem you. Root and branch, every part of you, even all of your, your whole body. Even if you die, I'm going to remember where you are and I'm going to come and get you here. I'll give you the Holy Spirit to show you that my intentions are correct. And, and I, I'm telling you the truth. And so that's the fruit of waiting. Here's the question when we're waiting. Do you get bitter with waiting or you become more patient and you begin to plan and to prepare. One of the thing, the thing about waiting can sometimes end in frustration, and we become we come to despair that we'll never get what we've been waiting for. I think in all of the movies that I've ever watched, the most powerful example of acting is Emma Thompson. Actually, Emma Thompson in anything, but Emma Thompson in Sense and Sensibility. She's in love with a clergyman, though God knows why. <laughs> Probably because she wants the money. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but she's in love with a clergyman, and he, uh, we think that he's, he loves her, but we're not sure because he's kind of his head's poked in the clouds a bit. We're not sure if he understands that Emma Thompson's alive for a long time, but then he seems to be nice to her, and she kind of has her hopes up. But she reads in the paper, she's away from London, and she reads in the paper that her beloved has married somebody else. And so she goes into despair and depression and get on with her life. It's been two years now. And one day there's a visitor. And her mother says, it's... I forget the man's name. It's the clergyman that she was in love with. And like, what? And he comes and we see her trying to steal her emotions. I think she's knitting or something. And the family's kind of backing away like, oh, we don't know what's going on here. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I wanted to come and see you. Well, I'm glad you made the visit. Thank you. So they had a really courteous kind of old-fashioned English dancing around everything, keeping one's feelings at bay. We can see it on her face. She's just like a dam holding back this tons of emotion. And she says, and how is the missus? The missus. Oh, my sister-in-law, you mean. They got married a couple years ago. You must have read that in the papers. My brother also is a clergyman. And he, yes, it's right. And he married. He's married. She said, you didn't marry no, goodness, no. He said, that was my sister. And suddenly she realizes he's not married and he's come to see me. And the dam begins to crack. And we watch her face. Suddenly she can't hold it back. And she begins to sob. And all the pent up stuff just comes pouring out as she rocks, embarrassed at her own emotions and saying to this man, who has a difficult with his own, time with his own emotions, that she loves him more than words could ever possibly say. And he just takes her hands. And we know 
all will be well. There's coming a time. It's not going to be like we imagine. All of our prophecy and predictions and prognostication and little booklets about the coming of the Lord are all false and all true. He's coming again. Our God, heaven cannot hold him, nor earth sustain, says Christy Roselli. Heaven and earth shall flee it away when he comes to reign. In that bleak midwinter, a stable place sufficed. The Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ. Something is going on in the dark, in the bleak midwinter. When we most despair, something is going on that we are not aware of. We can't figure it out. Something is gestating, growing. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given, in, hidden in the dark. But the dark is the beginning of a new day. It's not really the ending of the old day as much as it is the beginning of a new day. And so the Apostle Paul addresses the need for us to order our time differently than the heathen. Listen, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come suddenly as a thief in the night. And when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness. So as this day should overtake you as a thief. You're all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of dark and darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we wake or whether we sleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are all doing. We're living on a different clock. We're in the river of time, but we know something that the people around us do not know and that that river is flowing to the sea. We've got an appointment ahead with something that is sure and certain. And what is that something? The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. We have two families with us today that have escaped the bloody turmoil of ISIS and they're believers and they, they're here today and they were in that dark place just a little while ago and uncertainty and many of their relatives and friends still are and here they are in this place and, but they, they know something and they, they know something that Jesus can sustain you through difficult times. And in many ways, we have been blessed to live a cushy life. And we have, we have been able to think that those things can't affect us. And we've, we've been in an illusion. And the world tells us what, we, we, we are entitled to have all of our lives ordered correctly and us to live in prosperity and peace and all of that. But no, the Lord did not give us that assurance. But he told us this one thing. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Don't be overcome by the dark, but remember your children of the light in the middle of all this darkness there is a baby that has been promised that will redeem the world for he will save his people from their sins for the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air this is the word of the Lord this is what comforts us in the middle of our darkness that there is no dark that can overcome the, the the faintest candlelight. 
We sometimes act like the light's not light and the darkness is so powerful. We think that God got sick. He's got the flu. He's not doing well. He's getting old now. He probably won't make it. The devil's getting stronger. Oh, he's such a roaring lion. He's making such a fuss. Are you kidding me? The Bible said when the Lord comes, he's going to destroy him with the brightness of his coming. Evil will be put away. Uh, This is the truth. This is the truth. And that's what we celebrate in the Advent season. The truth of things is Jesus Christ will conquer every kind of evil in the world that we see around us. You, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you, Paul says. You are the children of the light, and the children of the day are not of the night and not of the darkness. I'm going to recommend you something. This, let's, go, let's go into the season this year. Maybe it's not been your custom. Maybe you're, even though you're a Christian, you celebrate a more secular Christmas. Let me invite you into um, a consecrated time. And you can still have all the parties you want and enjoy yourself. That's the great thing. Put up Santa Claus if you want to. I don't care. If you're a sourpuss, you don't like Santa Claus. What are, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Give it up. But there's something deeper for sure. And a lot, by the way, a lot of the people that upset about Santa Claus, they don't celebrate Advent either. They're just sourpusses. <laughs> so we have a little booklet here, and you can get one on your way out if you, don't, hadn't, if you didn't get one coming in called The Road to Christmas. Hunter and I and Sean Brown wrote it. It starts on the 1st of December, and that's what, Tuesday? Is that right? And you can read the introduction tomorrow. And then just every morning, this won't take you any time. Take 10 minutes. Read one of these each day. It goes all the way to Christmas, the 25th, and then, then there's, it keeps going. And it talks to you about what the coming of Christ is about why he came, how to order your time. Just take that little time each morning and make this Advent season count and understand the sense of entering into another stream of time. Embody the season. And then, if at all possible, join us here on Christmas Eve. Uh, and, and we will just celebrate the coming of the Lord. And if, if that's hard for you and we... We, uh, we know it is sometimes for some people in the middle of the night. You have other family obligations. Go somewhere. And their service is all during the day. I think they'll probably one be here on the campus uh, put on by one of our affiliated churches here. And uh, we'll let you know more about that. But decide to go to church on Christmas Eve. Celebrate it as the coming of the Lord. And I tell you, if you enter into this Advent, you'll be lighting a candle more than here in the front of the church you'll be lighting a candle that will lighten up all the darkness that you read on the news. And you'll begin to wait, not only remembering the coming of the Lord long ago, but the coming of the Lord that may happen in our own lifetime. Maybe this year, who knows? God grant it. Angels and archangels may have gathered there Cherubim and seraphim in the frosty air. But his mother only in her maiden bliss worshiped the beloved with a kiss. What can I give him? Poor as I am. If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. And if I were a wise man, I could do my part. Yet what can I give him? I'll give him my heart.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to heed it. Lord, help us to lean into Advent. Help us to lean into waiting, Lord. Help us to learn to wait. Teach us to wait, Lord. We pray that the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, will be made alive to us in this Advent season, that we will be changed and transformed and that we will become agents of change and transformation in our families, in our homes, in our communities. Teach us to wait, we pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, just a few things to mention to you this morning as we prepare to head into our um, widow's might offering that we'll take in just a few moments. So if you want to be preparing for that, go ahead and prepare for that. But I just want to make a few announcements, let you know about a few things that are going on. And I want to start by reminding you that this week, this, this Saturday and Sunday evenings, this is the Christmas with the Christ Church Choir Weekend here. And we're so excited. This is always a wonderful Christmas tradition for all of us at Christ Church, but also for the broader city of Nashville. So many people make this a part of the beginning of their holiday season. So we have tickets available in the lobby. We also have tickets in the bookstore. We also are selling tickets online. Um, we really want you to come. We really want you to bring your neighbors, bring your friends, bring your coworkers. It's going to be a wonderful time. We also, in addition to to our choir singing this year. We have a special guest that will be singing with the choir, our very own Joseph Habedank, who's a member of this church and is a, is a gospel singer, and uh, he's going to be wonderful. Y'all are just going to love hearing from him. So make, get your tickets today because it's coming up this weekend. We don't want to miss it. So Saturday and Sunday at 7 p.m., Christmas with the Christ Church Choir. We want to thank you all last Sunday for everyone who participated in the big give. You gave over 6,200 pounds of clothes and home goods and all sorts of things to Thrift Smart. So we thank you for giving to that. That helps our benevolence ministry to be able to give gift cards to folks who come to us in need that are setting up new homes or in need of clothes. We're able to give them gift cards. So thank you for giving. Next Saturday, the 5th, so in the evening we have the Christmas concert, but in the morning at 9 a.m. in Montel Hardwick Hall, we're having a men's breakfast. So this is just a general invitation to all the men in the church. It's going to be free. It's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship, of uh, just growing deeper in relationship with one another. So just all to all the men in the room, whatever age you are, whatever stage of life you're in, we invite you to come to the men's breakfast next Saturday, December 5th, 9 a.m. in Montel Hardwick Hall. And finally... Pastor Dan mentioned the Road to Christmas book that we've, this is our gift to you. It's free. This is, we want everyone to take one. So if you did not get one coming in this morning, make sure you get one as you exit the sanctuary. There's also a table in the foyer where they are. And we, we have another gift because we really want you to be able with your families to lean into Advent, as Pastor Dan said. So on the table in the foyer where the books are, we also have a set of Advent candles to give to everyone. So we just ask that you'd go pick up one of those for your family so that you can participate. There's a little instruction sheet that just tells you how you can participate in this and, and, and join with your family in celebrating the Advent season with us as a church. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are so glad that you're here. We want to get to know you. We want to say hey. Every Sunday, there's a Connect with Christ Church station in the foyer. There's a gift there for you. There's somebody there to greet you. Just if you're visiting, stop by that Connect booth and say hello to them. If you're visiting with us online, Pastor Linda and Pastor Jay are in the room. And so say hello to them as well. Let them know that you're here. They would love to pray with you, love to speak with you this morning. And and also, if you are exploring Christianity, if you're, if you're not sure what it means to be a Jesus follower, as Pastor Dan was preaching this morning about, if you just want to talk to somebody about what it means to, to begin a journey following Christ, to begin a journey as a Christian, every week in our foyer, we have an Exploring the Christian Faith station set up, and there's always a team there to pray with you, to answer any questions you have about Christ, about Christianity. Christianity, and uh, so please take advantage of that if you're exploring the Christian faith this morning. 
Well, we're going to invite the ushers to come forward. They're going to come forward and, 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 and collect our widow's might offering. Again, this is for benevolence needs in the church and in the community. We thank you for being so generous and giving to these needs. It's making a big difference. So we'll invite everyone to stand as we sing together. And as you sing, come forward and, and bring your offering. to Jesus. sing our benediction as we've been doing and so sing one another out of here and we will see you on saturday and sunday nights at christmas with the christ church choir remember to grab your tickets in the hallway as you leave god be with you till we meet again by his counsels guide up you with his feet securely God bless you all. Go in peace and serve the Lord.